So what if you broke the rules and snuck into a place that you weren't meant to be in? Whilst there, what if you encountered something, something so terrifying that it left you in a state of abject fear? Would you come clean about your misdemeanor? Could you open up about what you saw? Or would you hold on to your secret forever? Tonight's episode, we're going to find out. I've been told by the old boys that it's haunted. I was sit there on my own, no one come down that evening. You know, you got that shiver that goes right through you. And you could hear the plunk of the float going in the water. And it's like, hey, someone's here. Episode 3, The Angler's Tale. Hello there, I'm Tom Barrow and welcome to Inspector Paranormal. Tonight we're going to be heading deep into the English countryside to an area of ancient woodland known as Delamere Forest. On the outskirts of this woodland is a fairly innocuous golf course, but behind the lush greens and fairways lies a fishing pond with a dark and mysterious secret. Tonight our story belongs to 55 year old Richard, he's every inch the character of his 6 foot frame and has a no nonsense attitude to match. Now living in the Cheshire town of Winsford, Richard has one love, fishing. How many years have you been uh, angling for? Uh, since I was 6 or 7, coming up nearly 40, what, 8 years. Are there any drawbacks to angling then would you say? Not really. The only, the only drawbacks is people, you know, turning up or getting at horrible anglers. They don't treat the fish right. They don't respect nothing. They leave litter. So why do you enjoy it so much? I love the solitude because it gets me away from people. <laughs> <laughs> so people aside, Richard professes his indifferent and unusual connection to the world of the paranormal. We start with that one unescapable question. Do you believe in ghosts? Uh, yeah, in a way. But I'm not a full believer. But I, I do believe in the paranormal. I've had weird experiences. Uh, you know what I mean? I don't actively go out looking for it. It just it won't come to find me. <laughs> I can used to go out with a girl who's a bit of a, a hippie, and she sort of opened me up to a lot of ways. One of the things she said, she came fishing, she used to hate me fishing. And she came down one night and uh, I caught a fish and it opened her mind. She says, I've never seen out like it. It's like handling a baby. How, how, you know, how careful I was and that. I said, well, that's, that's a fishy safety sort of thing. And she, she realised, she said to me once about, because she does all the meditation and stuff, she said, do you know something? She said, you can naturally meditate. Because you, you read the water. And since she told me, I thought, eh, yeah, you've got a point there. You know what I mean? Because that's what I used to do, just, just stare at the water and read it. Always talking weird, like, but little things happen. You know, not so much in this house. I've got an instance, but uh, things just start moving for no reason. And I just look at it and go, shut up, go away. And it stop. Like like what? Anything. An ornament or something should start waving and there's no wind out. That happens quite a bit. But I just say, go away, and it stops. I've got that used to it. I just take it as normal now. Yeah, yeah. You know, if something odd, really weird happens, I'm just thinking, oh, you're messing with me again. Like, here we go again. Yeah, here we go again. <laughs> what, you, what do you want? What are you trying to tell me? Because that's how I take them now. It's a message of some sort. Well, have you ever been to see the spiritualist? I have been to psychic things. I can't exactly remember what it was, but obviously it was a medium doing the, the talk. He turned his back straight on me. He wouldn't even face me. But I had a friend, and she was very psychic. And when we got outside, she said, you... You, you put the up him. He said he knows what you are. <laughs> We're now going to take you back to the eerily calm waters of that fishing pond in the Cheshire countryside, which Richard has kindly found for me on Google Maps. 
Well, I can show you there on the computer. It's a, it's a little pond in the middle of a golf course in Delamere. It's a perfect place if you want to go to not be disturbed, isn't it? Yeah. I fished it for 12 years. Sometime in the 80s I fished it from, up until the late 90s. There was a period where I did fish it a lot, because I just thought, right, batter it. Because there, there was only one fish in there I wanted to catch. Uh, no one's ever, ever caught it. <laughs> For the listeners at home, how big is the pond? It's not very big at all. Uh, I'm not very good with acres, but I wouldn't even say it's an acre. And you could literally see, if someone was across the pond, you could probably see them. Would, would you say that? Yeah, or... yeah. It's in a high banking. So on that side, it's all flat. And then they've got big banks behind you. If anyone's coming down to you, you know they're coming because they've got to come down the bank. This particular pond and its fishing club had many rules installed, However, one rule remains steadfast above all. No night fishing. A few times you, you told me on um, previous phone calls that you probably not <laughs> obeyed the rules completely to the... Uh... No, I don't. It got to a point well, I got my car broke into one night because of the poachers. I kept putting it to the AGM every year. I said to him, I said, you've got to allow us to fish at night. I said, we're protecting it. Because if people turn up in the middle of the night, we can send them away. I said, if we stick with the rules, as soon as we've gone, the poachers turn up and they leave a mess. And it just come to a point where I just thought, I've had enough. They used to know what I did, but they never caught me. The only time I got caught, in a way, was early hours in the morning. It come light and the, the club turned up for a match and they woke me up. They said, how long have you been here? I said, oh, about an hour. <laughs> so despite his act of rebellion... Richard gradually hears several rumours going around the club. One that would easily stop the faint at heart from dare fishing at night. But not Richard. I've been told by the old boys that it's haunted. <sighs> Whatever. I just accepted it and just carried on fishing. We now move forward to the first night of our encounter, back in 1991. It was in the summer, obviously, because there wouldn't be much in the winter. It would come in dusk, so it would be about ten to half ten. I'd sit there on my own, no one come down that evening. And then, just so you couldn't see over the other side, you could hear this, like someone casting the rod. And you could hear the plunk of the float going in the water. And it's like, hey, someone's here. And it happened a couple of times. And I saw walk round and there was no one there. Did you think someone was genuinely there? Yeah, I per- I really did think there was someone there. To me, it was like, I didn't see him coming. Just, it, it really baffled me. Could it have been, an, like, a duck floating or kind of... No. ...a fish or... No, if you've heard a, a cast of a rod, he goes... Whoosh, and he plop. Someone's there fishing. Did, did you look around the, the, the pond to kind of see if anyone... Well, I was looking, but I couldn't see. It just gone dusk enough to we couldn't see, so I had to walk round to where I thought they were. And when I got there, there was no one there, and I thought, oh, not giving me a shiver. We're now going to open this up to our panellists. Tonight we're joined by our resident naysayer and sceptic Tom Page. And on the other side of the coin is internationally renowned psychic medium Jackie Dennison. So welcome all to the podcast. We're going to start with you, Jackie. Can anyone gain spiritual powers, or is it something that you're born with? Everyone is born with um, a psychic ability. It's like the baby that is looking in the corner of the room and smiling and there's no one there. Uh, I'm convinced that that baby is seeing someone from spirit who is looking over them, looking after them and making sure that they're okay, maybe entertaining them on our behalf. So we're all born with the ability. When we go to school, we have to learn all the practical stuff because we live in a, you know, a practical world. So everything that we naturally do on a psychic level is sort of put on a back burner, as it should be, while we go to school and learn things that we have to learn and and how to uh, live our lives. And then as a teenager, it very often comes back. So there's a lot of teenagers that are interested in psychic things, paranormal things. And then we go to work, we get married, we have children. um, And so it will go away again. Now, that's what happened to me. uh, And then it came back 
uh, later on in life uh, to me. So everybody has the ability. It's learning how to tune in to a natural ability that we've all got, learning how to remember how we connected uh, as we did when we were a small child. So Richard talks about having that meditative state with fishing. Do you think that's made him more receptive to the paranormal? Absolutely. Because when you meditate, uh, your vibration lifts. So you're not aware of your physical body. You're just there in the moment, enjoying whatever pastime that may be. With uh, something like fishing, it's very therapeutic. Um, I'm not a fisherman. (laughs) My dad was a fisherman, my son's a fisherman, but I'm not. But I can understand how that would be like a meditative state of mind because it's so relaxing. You're not there with anyone else. You're totally on your own. So you're focused and you're just really chilling out. So I think that would absolutely have a bearing on why um, he was able to be aware of there was something there other than what was physically there. So uh, Tom, uh, not to tempt fate, but what you say next might just well remove you from uh, Jackie's uh, Christmas card list. But what are your thoughts on spiritual powers? This is going to sound really, really morbid, but it's not supposed to be. But I just think when you die, you die... There's no reason why a cow or a horse wouldn't come back as a ghost. They're more likely to come back as a ghost than they are. Why don't they come back as ghosts? But surely people have other senses apart from sight, sound, taste and smell. Sometimes people experience stranger things such as uh, gut feelings and stuff like that. What do you think that's down to? I just think it's a psychological thing. I think if you're more open to it, you're more likely to think you've experienced something. I've said it multiple times, but it goes back to that psychological thing where you, if you expect something to happen or you believe something's going to happen, then you're more likely to think it's happened. With someone like me who's just totally interested in the science part of it, people like myself don't ever get any of these um, sort of hauntings or, you know, we don't see any ghosts. So nothing like that happens to us really, but because we don't believe it can happen, I think. So things just can't be purely coincidental, can they really? Or is there some kind of higher power to everything? We're just a living organism, aren't we? And when you die, you die. But the beauty of it is you don't know you're dead. <laughs> so, do you know what I mean? It's not like, you know, I don't believe there's an afterlife and you can come back from it. I think some people get comfort out of it as well, don't they? Believing that they go somewhere else afterwards. Whether I believe it, well, clearly I don't. <laughs> so, Tom, I've heard a little rumour that your favourite film is, in fact, Ghostbusters. Not a rumour, it's the truth. Well, I don't believe it's true, though. <laughs> but it is my favourite film, yeah. Along with Back to the Future, but I also know time travel is not true as well, so that's for a different podcast. (laughs) So Jackie, returning to the pond and the scene of our first incident, Richard hears the uh, distinct noise of someone casting off nearby. What could this be then? I think it's a ghost fishing. I really do. I think he's connected with, if he has checked every possible place that there could be someone there, and he's found nothing at all, which is, that's what I would do, then I would say there is only one other possibility because he is an angler. He is used to the sound that, you know, uh, casting the rod. It's a particular sound. You can't make that sound with anything else. And there was no one there to make that sound. So I think in his chilled out state, there's been another spirit energy there who has enjoyed that pastime and is still enjoying going fishing. So how can a ghost go fishing then? Well you know here's the thing because when I've spoken to different spirit energies they can recreate anything within where they are. So like a lot of people are avid gardeners and have a lovely garden when they've described their garden to me in spirit and they've said, I've got this there and I've got that there and I had that there. So in the case of the angler, I think he is very much aware that there's something there because he sounds a very down-to-earth guy and he ruled everything out. So I think that the fisherman in spirit is still enjoying fishing and I think in his dimension, 
there is still a pond there and he is still catching fish and putting them back. He's still enjoying his pastime. So Tom, what do you think is going on then? Is this paranormal? I mean, I'm a fisherman, maybe not to that extreme, but I do like my fishing. And again, when you're out in the wild, you hear all sorts of noises. More than likely animals and wildlife, you know, is in the middle of nowhere, um, wind brushing through the trees or anything. Or, you know, has he fallen asleep and he's dreamed it? Or, he's, you know, he might well be half asleep. Again, on all these researches out there, if you read, most ghost sightings are when people have just fell asleep or just woke up. And it's usually sleep paralysis, which is quite common, really. It's dreaming, like really vivid dreams. It's basically a hallucination, but it happens when you're in between deep sleep and being awake. Quite easily, like nodding off or he's just about to wake up and he's heard something. So we're now joined with our resident historian, Eli Lysitz. So, Eli, what do we know about the area of Delamere Forest then? Well, Delamere Forest, for me, has been a lover of history and a lover of, you know, frankly, the supernatural tales, the ghost stories that go with it. It's an absolute hotbed, and it's difficult to know where to start. Delamere Forest was a royal hunting forest going back for 900 years. But of course, before that as well, it was a place filled with ancient trackways. And coming up through the history, we've got civil war skirmishes galore in the forest. Those outriders, royalist outriders from Chester, who would ride out to see what was going on with the parliamentarian towns of Cheshire, would obviously use Delamere Forest as their kind of highway. And literally, we could pick two dozen instances of things that have happened there. One of the really interesting things for me with Delamere is the story that did the rounds in the local press in the early 1800s, which is the scene of a phantom battle that was spotted by two farmers who were walking through the forest one day and they see rising from the mud these figures. And this is recorded, as I say, in, when I say the local press, you've got a lot of gentlemen's magazines doing the rounds for antiquarians in that period. And this features six times as being something that was reported and it's effectively a Napoleonic battle scene that's playing out. But they thought Cheshire had been invaded. They obviously weren't great with the geography and figuring out, well, we're not that near to the sea. But this really did cause panic in the, the whole local community at the time. And it's been put down to some kind of mass hysteria with the worry of an invasion from Napoleon during the time. But it was very real to the people that saw it. Thanks to our panelists there. So let's continue on with our investigation at the Delamere Fishing Pond. So we next move forward several months later to the summer of 1991. But remember this key fact from earlier. The fishing club does not allow any night fishing. And Richard isn't really meant to be there. He's alone fishing under the cover of darkness. So, so what happened then? Same again, just going dusk. I was sitting there on my own, no one come down that evening. I saw someone in the distance walking across the golf course and I just thought, oh, where's he come from? There's nothing that way and there's nothing that way. So it's like, where's he come from and where's he going? I'm not very good at descriptions. All I can say, he was a bloke. I couldn't tell you how old he was when they weren't that close. So they had no torch, no light no. to kind of guide him and stuff? No, it wasn't a golfer because he didn't have any clubs around. I and mean, golfers won't be out when it's dusk going dark. Did you feel like <laughs> you had to kind of keep undercover to kind yeah, of... Yeah, yeah, I just kept my head down, you know what I mean? I thought, I hope he don't see me. It just seems, as you say, very odd for like, why would someone be in the middle of nowhere without any purpose? Because I just found it odd and I didn't feel it was spooky... It didn't bother me. I just was glad that he kept on going. He didn't see me. You show me on the map. There's no pathways. No. There's nothing in the way to get there. So. No. And that's that side. The golf course is where we don't. We come in from the other side. The fisherman. It's just I can't see it being a shortcut for anyone. It could be totally genuine, but all to this day, it's baffled me. Where's he come from? Because there's nothing that way. And where's he going? next experience and things started ticking in me I had to think something is going on down here weird 
Can you remember what time of year this was? Or? It'd be sometime in the summer, between June and October, because then it used to be fishing season. It only started in June. Was it dusk again? Or? No, it was, it was it was daylight. I'm sure it was early doors, so it could be like four or five in the morning. I don't sleep much when I'm fishing, but I was on my bed chair flat out. And uh, basically I just heard these footsteps coming round. I thought, oh... Dear. Did you think you'd been caught? Yeah, I thought, ah, oh, I mean, my time's up. So I swung my legs out, sat like him here, like up on my bed chair. I've got a brolly up. And these footsteps walked right up to the back of me brolly and stopped. So I'm like, waiting for an ad poke round the corner and go, Oi, what are you doing here? I'm looking and waiting and nothing, not, just silence, nothing, never, never heard that again. So we got up and looked over the brolly and there's nothing there. And that, you know, you get that shiver that goes right through you and you're like, Oop. And I went round the back thinking, it's got to be an animal and there's nothing there. Come back round, sat back down, and I thought, oh my god, that was spooky. And I really did feel like legging it. I've got I've got chills right now. I've got chills. <laughs> so like, how terrified were you that something was just inches away from you? I know. I was really debating packing up, but I just thought, nope, calm down, calm down, calm. There's nothing there, there's nothing there. And uh, eventually I just carried on. I'm Quite an ardent bloke to scare, but it has never left me. I always thought, I wonder what it was. So we're now going to open this back up to our panellists, Jackie Dennison and Tom Page. So Jackie, Richard first of all sees someone walk across the golf course at night, completely alone, with no purpose, on a pathway to absolute nowhere. Do you think any of this could be supernatural at all? It's difficult to answer, really, because um, I haven't got a perspective of where he would have been looking. So if it's at night time, is it a trick of the light? I'm presuming there are no street lights there. So therefore, is it the moonlight that is playing tricks on the eyes? Or did he physically see someone? He, he does sound a very sort of down to earth guy. And he's not phased by it either. You know, he's not like he's going to run away or anything. He says, oh, yeah, there's a, a guy walking across. Where's he going to? And I would question that, you know, where is this man going to? Why is he there? So there is a possibility that he did see, you know, uh, an apparition. So, Tom, what do you think? We already established earlier that there was poachers in the area. And he'd said about maybe staying, you know, fishing at night to keep the poachers away. Poacher has seen him and thought getting out of here you know that's the first thing I thought so we're now going to go to the most terrifying part of the interview where someone walks directly up to Richard's tent Tom what do you think is going on first thing I thought again was the sort of sleep paralysis side of things or a wild animal because if you're sat still perfectly quiet and wild animals would tend to come out at night you know f to feed and if it creeps upon you and then you move the animal will just run and wild animals will do anything but confront a human well, that's the first thing I thought. Well, he's either been dreaming it or he's heard something coming behind him, got up to see what it was, and then whatever it was has ran off. Whatever it was, he's probably seen if he had any food lying around. I remember going camping years ago and there was a noise outside. You could hear something coming up to the tent. You could hear a noise. And then one of my friends who was in the tent next to us opened the tent up and then that was it. The noise stopped. And when we got up in the morning, all the food had been messed with. There was all claw marks. So obviously something's been rooting in the food and then as soon as it heard one of us move, it ran off, you know. And I think it's probably something similar. So Jackie, what's your opinion on this? Are we dealing with something supernatural? I think you've got two things probably going on there. One, that Richard is of a heightened state of awareness. It's night time. He's in his tent. He's not supposed to be there. You know, so he is aware of any sound. He's all, you know, it's like um, when you've got children very young and you, you know, you're sleeping. You don't sleep properly because you're aware of you need to be awake for them if they wake. So it's a similar sort of state of awareness. I think that Richard probably was in at that moment in time. And so he was acutely aware of any noise that was different to what he expected to hear. The fact that he heard footsteps coming to his tent and was literally going to go, oh yeah, caught me out, sorry about that, pal. I think he was absolutely convinced. I think he did hear something. I think he really has had encounters. 
So maybe that other person that walked up to the tent, the footsteps that he heard, maybe that was another angler who had uh, since, you know, passed away, but was still, you know, enjoying being there at that time. Might not have even been aware that Richard was there. So we're now joined back with our resident historian, Eli Lysit. So Eli, is there anything about this pond in particular that stands out then? There is. And the reason that we can pin this kind of thing down is those ponds throughout Delamere Forest, the key is in the name in the word pond, because of course they were once owned by various institutions, Vale Royal Abbey being a good example, but other abbeys around Cheshire too. And they were very contentious places because if I was to go and fish in a pond in Delamere Forest during the medieval period, I could get strung up just for doing that because those rights belong to someone else. And a body of water that draws people in to an otherwise empty landscape, there's a reason that people would go there. So that's where people are drawn to. It's a bit like trespassing. Well, it is trespassing. It's the one place you don't want to go, but it's the one place you can get food from without risking chasing around the forest trying to shoot a deer. But here's where it gets really interesting. Just a mile away from where that pond is, is a plague stone. Now, plague stones were erected during, well, latterly during the 1600s in the plague that we all think about in the 1660s, but also earlier examples are found from the period of the Black Death. I mean, plague stones are, if somebody should Google one, you will have spotted them if you're out hiking or walking. Probably thought they were a gatepost. It might be a basin or a taller stone with these recesses marked out of it. And this isn't really important because what that represents, if you imagine a stone with a couple of recesses hollowed out where people could go and take food from neighbors, leave money, because you didn't want to interact personally, somebody's got plague, good idea to keep your distance. And actually they used to put urine in the recesses in the stone, because they believe that will cleanse the money from the plague. But that particular spot was a meeting point for all of those communities. And that's really important because they aren't just erected anywhere. So we know that during that time period, you've got to think about food is scarce. What food can you get in the middle of the forest if you're not going to risk trying to kill a deer? You can fish. So it's very central to that plague stone being located there. So there's definitely a community there existing throughout that period and during the 1300s. We know that anyway from the historical record. But to kind of zone it in to a a square mile, where you put those two things together, they're going to be in use. The pond is going to be fished. The plague stone is where people will go to try and take things from the other communities that are looking to support them through that period. So it's very central. If you talk to anybody who's a a student or a fan of medieval history, who goes one beneath the headlines that we all think of, the issue of ponds and fishing rights, we can have some fantastic tales that are on the back of just the most mundane feature of the landscape, because it was all about control. And if I start fishing in your pond and I don't have the right to, and you don't do something about it, what am I going to do next? So the connection between the supernatural and fishing goes a long way, would you say? Throughout Cheshire and the counties that adjoin Cheshire, there's a whole tradition of not going near isolated ponds for all kinds of inland mermaids and creatures associated with them. And they're places that naturally draw that kind of fascination and the folklore attached to them. There's actually a couple of spectral apparitions, for want of a better word, recorded in the ancient ledger books. So, in a chronicle from Vale Royal Abbey, it's mentioned that there's a haunted area of the forest. Now, that could apply to lots of areas of the forest, but the person writing it is also the person who wrote down the legal recourse for a lawsuit that was going on during the time featuring the rights of fishing in that area of Delamere Forest. More than anywhere else, really, can be so individualistic, and you've got to think that's come from communities being wary of that very spot very specific, very specific, that spot for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years. So something to think about that the uh, reputation of that area was no less wondrous 700 years ago than it is today. So you just assume it's an average pond in the middle of nowhere, but there's so much personal history and tragic history associated with that area too. It just makes you stop and think. Yeah, it's funny how when you think about the landscape and 
You know, there's nothing more mundane than just a pond or a pool of water, you know, isolated in a landscape, but actually it's very contentious. And there are these beacons that are located throughout our landscape and our history that you don't think twice about, but actually, you know, there's so much connected to those situations that you can find all manner of wondrous tales directly attached to the most mundane feature. So that's it. Our fishing gear has been packed up in haste as we get the heck out of Delmere Forest. I want to thank Richard for stepping forward tonight and allowing the inspector team to investigate. Next time an inspector, we're off to Stafford to relive a series of terrifying events that pushed a young couple to breaking point. I came home from work, I had a shower, and I heard knocking on the bathroom door. It was really, really creepy. Just felt like you were being chased. Someone was down there behind you. So I'd say, just leave me alone. Inspector Paranormal was produced, written and presented by me, Tom Barrow. Show panellists were Jackie Dennison and Tom Page. Historical research conducted and presented by Eli Lysen. The Inspector theme was written and produced by Matt Davies. Additional music provided by Storyblocks and Upbeat. This is an independent podcast made by CW9 Productions. <laughs>